When it comes to controversial science projects, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, or HARP, is right up there with the moon landings and chemtrails on the conspiracy hit list. But once you get past the wilder theories and claims, the basis of the science and its aims is no less intriguing. So just what is HARP and why is it so controversial? Some of the many reasons why HARP attracts so much attention comes from the claims of scientifically uninformed theorists that say it can control the weather, set off earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, bring down missiles and planes, disrupt worldwide communications and influence people's minds and moods. If that were true, then it would be one of, if not the most powerful pieces of technology on the planet and hidden behind government and military secrecy. Yet HARP is unclassified though it was funded and jointly managed by the US Air Force, US Navy and DARPA. But due to budget cuts in 2014, the ownership of the site and all the equipment was transferred to the University of Alaska Fairbanks, who now also run it. So what is the purpose of HARP? Well, its basic remit is to study the ionosphere, its interaction with space weather and how it affects radio communications here on Earth as well as the generation of VLF, that's very low frequency, and ELF, extremely low frequency radio waves, which can travel around the world and penetrate deep under the sea for communications with submarines and into the ground to reveal underground structures. HARP deals with some complex science and how it operates is equally complex, but the basic principle is to try and replicate how the sun affects the upper atmosphere to create the ionosphere and how it then goes on to affect it. But to do this in a controlled, repeatable way, and of course on a much, much smaller scale. Now, in order to understand HARP, we need to know a little about the ionosphere. This is a constantly changing area of the Earth's upper atmosphere that reaches from about 60 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers in altitude, where it's thin enough so that the sun's ultraviolet and X-rays can reach it, but thick enough so that it can absorb these rays and ionize the gases there. It's also well above the area called the troposphere where we live. Ionization is the process where high energy radiation strips away an electron from a neutral atom or molecule and creates a negatively charged electron and a positively charged ion. That's an atom with a missing electron. This process creates a shell of these charged particles around the Earth, which we call the ionosphere. This stripping of the electrons also releases energy in the form of heat and light. This light is called air glow and is similar to how the auroral lights are formed in the polar regions, but it also makes the night sky everywhere glow very slightly. And you can see this on a dark, clear night with a sensitive camera and sometimes by eye. Normally, in the dense atmosphere near the surface of the Earth, the negative electrons and positive ions would recombine very quickly. But because the gas in the upper atmosphere is much less dense, the particles are much farther apart and remain separated for much longer. With all these free electrons floating around, the high atmosphere becomes conductive, starting at around 60 kilometers, peaking intensity at 300 kilometers, and then by the time it gets to 1,000 kilometers, it's dropped almost to nothing, where the atmosphere becomes too thin and then the vacuum of space takes over. In fact, the ionosphere separates into three layers called the D, E and F layer, with D being at the lowest altitude, rising up to F at the highest altitude. Because these layers are conductive, they interact with electromagnetic waves like radio broadcasts from the surface. Depending upon their frequency, some radio waves will be absorbed, some will bounce off the electron layer and be reflected, and some will pass right through with little resistance. As these layers are created by the sun's energy, they can change dramatically from day to night, summer to winter. And in fact, the lowest D layer only exists in the daytime and completely disappears at night. They're also affected by high solar activity and solar flares and thus affect radio transmission similarly. HARP uses up to 3.6 megawatts of high frequency radio signals in the two to 10 megahertz range to excite and heat the gas molecules 
in a small area of the ionosphere directly above the facility. It does this with the main instrument, the IRI, or the Ionospheric Research Instrument. This is the heater. It's a phased array radio transmitter with a 180 antenna in a grid covering about 100,000 square meters or about 24 acres. This array works like one large transmitter, but it can electronically steer the beam over about a 30 degree angle. By the time the signal has reached the ionosphere, it's spread out to a size of between 60 to 100 kilometers across, depending upon its frequency and configuration. By rapidly steering the beam around this small patch of sky, it can modulate the heating process to create signals like VLF and ELF waves. Among the many misconceptions about HARP, probably the biggest is its power output, as this is seen as undeniable proof that it is capable of doing all the wild things claimed of it. Its stated maximum power is 3.6 megawatts, but this is often mistaken for another much larger figure, its ERP output, and that can be up to 5.8 gigawatts. So why are there two wildly different figures for the same facility? Well, HARP's output is 3.6 megawatts, but in the broadcast industry, there is another figure called ERP, or effective radiated power. And here is where people get confused between actual power and ERP, because they don't understand what ERP represents. But one thing is for sure, you can't put in 3.6 megawatts and get out 5.8 gigawatts as some claim. It's just physically impossible. In fact, you can't get out a single microwatt more than you put in. If you did, then A, you've just solved all the world's energy needs by creating a machine that makes more energy than it uses, and B, you've just broke the law of physics, and in particular, the law of conservation of energy. HARP has to focus its 3.6 megawatts onto a small area of sky hundreds of kilometers above using its antenna array, like a torch focuses its light into a tight beam. That 5.8 gigawatt ERP is a fictional figure used by engineers in the broadcast industry to indicate how powerful the transmitter would have to be if there was no focusing and the whole sky was covered to the same power intensity at the target distance, which in this case is the small patch of sky 300 kilometers above HARP. That ERP figure can change dramatically from tens of megawatts to gigawatts, depending upon how efficient the antenna is deemed to be at focusing the radio transmissions. The tighter, more focused the beam, the higher the ERP figure will be. The more spread out, the lower the ERP figure will be. But at the end of the day, the most HARP can transmit is 3.6 megawatts. With the inefficiencies in the system, the divergence of the beam and the absorption of the atmosphere, by the time it gets to the ionosphere, it's down to 36 milliwatts or 36 thousandths of a watt per square meter of sky in the target zone. The amount of energy from the sun falling on the same square meter of sky by comparison is 1,367 watts, about 37,000 times more energy than HARP. As one scientist put it, it's like trying to heat the Yukon River with a domestic immersion heater. But in case you think I'm just making it all up, consider this. If that 5.8 gigawatts was real, where does the power come from? 5.8 gigawatts of electricity is far more than the whole of Alaska generates and is enough to supply 4.6 million US households, assuming each house is using an average of 1.26 kilowatts as stated by the US Energy Information Administration. That's the equivalent of New York, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas combined. The biggest non-hydroelectric power station in the US is the Palo Verde nuclear plant in Arizona at 3.9 gigawatts. And that would still be short by nearly two gigawatts. So where is the massive power station near HARP and the transmission infrastructure required to supply this fictional 5.8 gigawatts? It doesn't exist. In fact, HARP's power actually comes from five 2.5 megawatt diesel generators on the site. So if the power output is one of the biggest misconceptions about HARP, the other comes from its history, and in particular, a patent filed by the physicist Bernard J. Eastland. 
To find out why, you have to go back to an area of Alaska before Harp was constructed and to the oil and gas company Atlantic Richfield, also known as Arco, and Bernard Eastland. Arco had the rights to the huge natural gas fields in Alaska's North Slope region, but they were far from their main customers and the cost of liquefying and transporting the gas was prohibitive. What they needed was a customer that would be nearby. Bernard Eastland was an MIT-trained physicist who'd worked at the US Atomic Energy Commission during the 1960s and 70s. He specialized in plasma physics and co-developed the fusion torch, a method of using high-temperature plasma of a nuclear fusion reactor to convert waste materials into reusable elements. In the 1980s, Eastland was working for Arco and became the president of Arco's Production Technologies International Company in Houston. He suggested that Arco could use the natural gas reserves to power a huge antenna complex to focus high-energy radio beams into the ionosphere. This would heat up the gas atoms to create artificial plasma layers in the ionosphere, but in a way which could be controlled, moved and shaped by equipment on the ground. Alaska would be in a good position because the Earth's magnetic field lines go up almost vertically in that area. Each antenna would create a circularly polarized radio beam that would spin the particles around the magnetic field lines at the resonant frequency of the ions in the same way that a cyclotron works to accelerate particles. This would heat up the plasma and allow it to move along the magnetic field lines to higher altitudes. Eastland was granted a US patent, number 4686605, for the invention titled Method and apparatus for altering a region in the Earth's atmosphere, ionosphere, and or magnetosphere on August the 11th, 1987. Now, whilst Eastland filed the patent, he did so whilst working for Arco, and as such, Arco owned the patent. Sometime afterwards, Eastland disassociated himself from it and Arco and set up his own research company. Eastland's patent makes some very interesting, if not technical, reading and some extraordinary claims. Some of the claims include that it could disrupt communications both around the Earth, but also to and from satellites, missiles, and air and sea craft by randomly modulating areas of the ionosphere which are relied upon to propagate radio signals around the Earth, and thus effectively scramble the signals. Now, back in the late 1950s and early 60s, the US and Soviets exploded nuclear weapons in the magnetosphere high above the Earth. We also have a video on that if you want to see it. This created large amounts of charged particles which were found to travel along the magnetic field lines in a spiral motion and bounce back and forth between the mirror points at their ends at very high speed. This created a lot of radio noise that could blind radar systems and was thought at the time could cause the electronics of nuclear missiles to fail. One of the patent claims was that a plasma layer could be created and used to trap some of the plasma particles, which would then oscillate between the new layer and the mirror points on the magnetic field lines to create interference that could have a similar effect to the nuclear tests, but without having to detonate a nuclear device in space. Other uses include heating large areas of the ionosphere to move them to much higher altitudes, to create unexpected and unplanned drag forces on missiles and satellites and cause them to become unstable in their travel. Also, weather modification. By affecting the upper atmospheric wind patterns, by stacking of different shaped plumes of particles to create a lens effect, and then concentrating solar energy over an area or altering the course of a jet stream to move adverse weather like hurricanes or denying rain to drought prone areas. It was also claimed to be able to make a wave reflector in the sky to steer ELF signals to a depth of a kilometre or more. The reflections would then be picked up by a satellite and after processing could reveal hidden structures, a bit like a CAT scan of the Earth. Another reason to use ELF waves is that the frequency of brain waves in humans lays in the 3 to 12 hertz range, very similar to that of ELF signals. It was suggested that directing such a frequency at an enemy might have a detrimental effect on their mood and ability to operate. But it wasn't all destructive. Eastland suggested that it could be used to modify the molecular makeup of the upper atmosphere, 
increasing the levels of ozone to fill the ozone hole and to break up various chemical entities such as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and nitrous oxides. Even though the claims in the patent seemed extraordinary and were probably somewhat over the top, Arco still passed the idea of the ionospheric heater and its possible uses to Simon Ramo, who had led the development of microwave and missile technology and was instrumental in the creation of the ICBMs. He passed it to the Defense Department, who then gave it to the Pentagon's advanced research arm DARPA. The big claims may well have raised a few eyebrows in the military and its electronic beam steering and reflection technology would have been of great interest to them, but the overall size of the proposed project would have been massive. For Eastland's patent to create the effects it claimed were possible, it would call for a site with a maximum output of 100 gigawatts of true power, not the fictional ERP figure. That's some 27,700 times more powerful than HARP's 3.6 megawatts. If Eastland's design used the same 20 kilowatt antennas and layout dimensions as at HARP, it would need 5 million antennas, which would take up an area measuring 51 kilometers by 51 kilometers, big enough to cover the city of Houston in Texas. This is why Eastland and Arco suggested that the power should come from the huge natural gas reserves of Alaska's North Slope. It would have been a massive cash cow to Arco to supply the gas. To put this 100 gigawatt requirement into context, it's 9% of the United States total electrical power capacity of 1100 gigawatts. The biggest gas-fired power stations in the world are in Russia and can generate 5.5 gigawatts of power each. Eastland's array would need 18 of these working at full power to supply the 100 gigawatts. Eastland's idea was just too grandiose, but the scientists saw the opportunity to build a much smaller facility that would allow them to test ideas and gain a much greater understanding of the ionosphere. So with the help of the Alaskan Senator Ted Stevens, $10 million of funding was provided and paid to ARCO to build a prototype heart research facility at a site of a US Air Force over-the-horizon radar which had been cancelled before completion at Gakona, Alaska. Because of the location of HARP, it would be able to tap into the auroral electrojet, an electric current that circulates in the polar regions of the ionosphere. By modulating the auroral electrojet with an ELF wave, it would act like an incredibly long virtual antenna high in the sky to transmit these VLF and ELF signals something that the US Navy were particularly interested in. So now we can see where we get this conflation of ideas between the HARP research facility and Eastland's original patent, but the two are not the same. HARP operates sporadically throughout the year for short periods of time and does not use microwaves to energize the atmospheric gases as some people think, so it's not like a giant microwave oven. Its operating frequency of 2 to 10 MHz is 2,000 times lower than the 2.45 GHz used in a microwave oven. And you know when HARP is working because you can hear its characteristic tones in the shortwave band up to many thousands of kilometers away. HARP is not the only site like this. There are other smaller ones in Russia and Norway, but HARP is the most powerful and has been able to create controlled effects in the ionosphere such as faint airglow, ELF and VLF signals. It's detected previously unknown ionospheric effects which have advanced our understanding of the ionosphere greatly, and some say that it's proof of concept that Eastland's ideas could work. So what are your views on HARP? Should we do this sort of research considering its origins or leave well alone? Let me know in the comments. So thanks for watching and don't forget to check out some of our other videos if you get the time. And please subscribe, thumbs up and share.